todavía. Hola, Teresita. <ríe> Hola, Jaime, ¿cómo estás? Bien. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Daniel Núñez, eh, a nombre de la Universidad del Desarrollo y de la Universidad de Talca. Eh, quiero darles la, una cordial bienvenida al encuentro internacional denominado El rol de la regulación emocional en la salud mental, eh, perspectivas básicas y aplicadas. Primero, eh, se dirigirán, eh, dirigirán a ustedes la decana de la Facultad de Psicología de, de la Universidad del Desarrollo, eh, Teresa Sierra, eh, Serrano Gildemeister, y posteriormente el decano de la Facultad de Psicología de la Universidad de Talca, el doctor Ismael eh, Gallardo eh, Cuadra. Eh, bueno, yo quiero darle la más cordial bienvenida al seminario de parte de la Facultad de Psicología, a este seminario El rol de la regulación emocional en la salud mental, perspectivas básicas y aplicadas. Bueno, este es un seminario que es una iniciativa que es organizada por el Programa de Investigación Asociativa PIA en Ciencias Cognitivas de la Facultad de Psicología de la Universidad de Talca y el Centro de Apego y Regulación Emocional de la Universidad del Desarrollo. Así que, de lo más cordial, bienvenida también a nuestros colegas de la Universidad de Talca. Bueno, en el campo de la psicología, la temática abordada, específicamente la regulación emocional, es uno de los mecanismos explicativos centrales, tanto el desarrollo normativo como desviado en niños, adolescentes y adultos y se enmarca en la actividad de difusión de la a la comunidad que desarrolla nuestra Facultad de Psicología y Universidad del Desarrollo, constituyéndose esta en el segundo seminario internacional en el ámbito de las habilidades socioemocionales. Este programa de seminario aborda temáticas desde múltiples perspectivas, por un lado a nivel individual, focalizándose en los componentes psicofisiológicos y neurocognitivos comprometidos en la regulación emocional, y a nivel relacional, es decir, atendiendo al desarrollo o a la desregulación emocional a partir de la interacción con otros, considerando distintos contextos de relación, padres, hijos, parejas, y diferentes etapas del desarrollo humano en el que se despliegan dichos procesos regulatorios. Además, también se aborda la investigación que establece el rol de la regulación emocional y, y el rol que juega en la salud mental y en los trastornos psiquiátricos, así como también su tratamiento o intervención. Bueno, y la verdad que contamos con un amplio grupo de investigadores internacionales, tanto de Estados Unidos y Europa, como nacionales, que compartirán el estado de su investigación sobre el tema. Así que damos la más cordial bienvenida a todos ellos y agradeciendo desde ya su participación. Y entre los invitados internacionales destaca el doctor James Cross, quien es un investigador de gran trayectoria y reconocimiento en el campo de la regulación emocional y la ciencia afectiva. James es presidente fundador de The Society for Affective Science, coeditor en jefe de la revista Affective Science, y miembro de Association for Psychological Science and the American Psychological Association. Muy bienvenido, James, a esta actividad. Estamos muy contentos que puedas participar con nosotros. Esta iniciativa busca nutrir y aportar a la discusión pública y privada en relación al rol de la regulación emocional en la salud mental tan relevante hoy día, dada la situación de pandemia que estamos experimentando y sus consecuencias en la salud integral, generando un diálogo rico en experiencia y en evidencia. Por eso agradecemos la presencia de tan destacados investigadores y a todos los participantes que se sumaron rápidamente y de manera masiva a esta invitación, y también a la alianza con la Facultad de Psicología de la Universidad de Talca, que no me cabe duda que con quienes este será el punto de partida de una serie de otras actividades e iniciativas que seguiremos realizando y desarrollando en conjunto. Así que muchas gracias y muy bienvenidos a este encuentro. Bien, por mi parte, eh, saludo a todos y a todas el día de hoy. En esta instancia eh, internacional 
tan relevante para poder comprender el estado de la regulación emocional, con la compañía además de algunos de los más destacados investigadores nacionales e internacionales. Agradezco enormemente además la invitación que nos hace también la Universidad del Desarrollo a poder compartir con ellos eh, y con nosotros ahora eh, una serie de nuevas instancias de encuentro que nos permitan desarrollar también la investigación eh, ahora también desde regiones, junto con lo que ocurre desde Santiago. Como bien decía la decana Teresita Serrano, esta es una iniciativa que también incluye un programa de investigación importante dentro de la Universidad de Talca, que es el programa de investigación asociativa, que busca promover eh, la investigación transnacional y multidisciplinar en conducta y en psicopatología, tanto en ámbitos sociales, clínicos y experimentales, basados en la comprensión de cuáles son los procesos básicos eh, subyacentes, tanto cognitivos, neurales y relacionales. Desarrollando entonces investigación psicobiológica y en desarrollo eh, psicopatológico en procesos cognitivos eh, del cerebro y relacionales, eh, en investigación relacional, además en psicología y en procesos cerebrales de atención, percepción y memoria, entre otros objetivos que son muy relevantes. Nuevamente quiero agradecer la instancia de poder encontrarnos en este espacio virtual que nos da la oportunidad de esta situación tan extraña que es la de cuarentena. Agradezco también eh, a, a nuestros eh, perdón, invitados internacionales y a todos aquellos investigadores que tanto desde la Universidad de Talca como la Universidad de Desarrollo nos han permitido estar en esta instancia de encuentro y de conocimiento. Así que muchas gracias a todos y les deseo la mejor de la jornada. Bien, muchas gracias. Eh, los invitamos a participar en esta actividad eh, realizando sus preguntas a lo largo eh, de la misma. En la sección preguntas, que está en la barra inferior de Zoom, ¿cierto? y les pedimos que el chat lo usen solo en caso de problemas técnicos y otras interacciones con, con el panelista. Eh, aprovecho de comentarles que esta actividad está siendo transmitida a través del canal de streaming de la universidad udd.tv.udd.cl y durante los próximos días eh, dejaremos disponibles los videos de las actividades autorizadas por los expositores en el sitio web de, la, de cada facultad. Para seleccionar la interpretación simultánea deben, eh, deben seleccionar el icono del globo terráqueo que encontrarán en la barra inferior de su panel de Zoom. Al pinchar deben seleccionar el idioma en el que quieran escuchar toda la actividad sin importar en qué idioma eh, hable el expositor. De todas formas, estaremos pendientes al chat por cualquier problema o ayuda que ustedes necesitan. Bien, bueno, esperando que la tecnología y las conexiones nos acompañen, ¿cierto? Eh, les pedimos, eh, les agradecemos su, su participación y pedimos su consideración si, si tuviésemos algún problema. Y agradecemos a todos los profesionales y estudiantes que estuvieron interesados en participar en esta eh, actividad. Bueno, nuestra primera presentación, eh, estamos muy contentos por ello, ¿verdad? Porque Teresita ya algo dijo que se trata de, de una de las personas que quizás más sabe en el mundo o que más ha investigado en el mundo sobre el tema que convoca esta, esta actividad. Y la primera eh, presentación se denomina eh, Regulación Emocional, a cargo del doctor James Gross. Él es profesor de, de, la, de Psicología de la Universidad de Stanford y ahí dirige el Laboratorio de Psicofisiología de Stanford. Bueno, todos sabemos, su investigación se ha centrado en la regulación de las emociones y su trabajo ha sido reconocido internacional, internacionalmente, ¿cierto? Como, como uno, un aporte eh, relevante y fundamental a la comprensión de la conducta humana y un aspecto, aspecto específico de esto, como, como es el procesamiento de las expresiones. Ha recibido distintos premios, tanto por su labor docente como por su trabajo eh, como investigador. Destaca entre estos últimos el reconocimiento otorgado por la Asociación Americana de Psicología, la Sociedad de Investigación Psicofisiológica y la Sociedad de Neurociencia Social y Afectiva, y así como también ha recibido eh, un, un doctorado honorífico de la Universidad de Lovaina. Bueno, él tiene más de 450 publicaciones que han sido citadas eh, más de 140 mil veces, eh, y eh, es, ya lo dijo Teresita, es... Eh, eh, presidente y fundador de distintas eh, agrupaciones. Por último, ha, ha dirigido una gran cantidad de investigaciones que, como ya dije, ¿cierto? Ha, ha, han significado que, que sea una persona eh, alta, que su trabajo sea reconocido como un trabajo eh, sumamente importante. Es para nosotros entonces un honor contar con la posibilidad de iniciar este encuentro con la presencia del doctor Gross, a quien agradecemos eh, haber aceptado nuestra invitación. Doctor Gross, eh, por favor. Thank you very much, Dr. Nunes, and um, thank you all for uh, inviting me to participate. I'm just going to share my uh, desk, uh, slide deck um, and uh, want to make sure that everyone can see the slides. If someone could confirm that you can see my slides, please. Yes, 
Perfect. Uh, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here with you today. And um, my goal is to share uh, some of the thinking and work that we and others have done on this topic of emotion regulation. And in particular, I'll be doing five things, talking uh, briefly about the terms that we use in this field, introducing the process model of emotion regulation, and then thinking about two different types of regulation, trying to make the important point that these have very different consequences. And then we'll save some time, uh, if possible, for questions and discussion. So it's really an honor, as I say, to be part of this uh, international gathering. Uh, I feel very grateful for the chance to share some of the thinking uh, that we've done. And I think if uh, we reflect on our experiences, most of us have had the experience of sometimes having emotions like anger or fear or sadness or happiness that were very helpful in that moment. We were very glad to feel those emotions because they helped us achieve some of the goals that we had. At other times, I think we can really, all of us, find moments in our own lives and in the lives of people we love where our emotions, whether they're anger, fear, sadness, anxiety, or happiness, were out of place and were not helpful for us. And it's in that latter case I'll be focusing. Times when we have emotions and for some reason we feel that these emotions are unhelpful given our goals. And as we uh, talk together today, I'd like you to hold in mind these moments of emotions when they're not as helpful as we'd like them to be. And to make sure we're all on the same page, I'd like to start with a short video segment. During this video segment, you'll see that there's a, a pair of people talking about reptiles. And during the presentation, the filmed presentation, you'll see that a lizard jumps unexpectedly onto one of the two men and we'll see his reaction. So let's take a look at that together. But uh, can I find this in Arlington? Oh, good grief, yes. Oh boy. Uh, let, let me, let's see how long it is. Let's hold okay. it out. Okay. Here's the lizard uh, probably about to, to five jump onto this man with a dark Texas jacket. rat snakes are gonna be one of the largest snakes that you find in the Metroplex area. <laughs> what the <f> <laughs> <laughs> Get this thing off me, man. Get this thing off me, man. <laughs> <laughs> what is this thing jumping at me for, man? He likes you. Yeah, I can tell, man. <laughs> All right, let's try to get back under control. <laughs> you didn't tell me the thing jumped. <laughs> well, oh, God, dang. <laughs> Almost. I'm a... <laughs> okay, let's try to get our composure here. <laughs> You're all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, the Texas rat snake can be up to five feet long, huh? That's right. <laughs> uh, some of them can get upwards and approach seven feet. But, uh... So this uh, um, video segment, I think, uh, is a humorous way to make a very important and serious point. That our emotions often play out over time and in social circumstances. Sometimes these emotions are helpful, but other times, like this case, they're very unhelpful. And when we find that our emotions are unhelpful, we often try to do things to, to, to regulate, to influence these emotions, as this poor man was doing to try to regain his composure. Now, what's interesting about this topic of emotion regulation that'll be your focus in the, in the conference that you're attending is that this topic has a very long past. As far back in Western civilization as Plato's Phaedrus, we hear discussions of charioteer trying desperately to manage the impulses of the two steeds that represent the passions or emotions. And in many world traditions, in fact, there's been a central concern over how we manage or influence the emotions that give rise to much of our behavior. But even though emotion regulation has a long past dating thousands of years, it also has a very short history in terms of its empirical uh, basis. This is a uh, plot of uh, citations using the exact phrase emotion regulation. In the light blue bar solid, we see citations to emotion regulation in Google Scholar. This is not a cumulative plot. 
This is a year by year plot showing that each year there is a dramatic increase in the number of papers uh, concerned with emotion regulation. And for, for comparison purposes, we've introduced the term mental control, which you can see goes along at a steady pace. So there's been this exponential increase so that as of 2019, there were over 20,000 papers for that year alone on this topic. This has led commentators uh, such as Sandra Kuhl to say that the tremendous increase in research volume has rendered the study of emotion regulation one of the most vibrant areas in contemporary psychology. And notice he said that more than a decade ago when the citations were only a few thousand a year and compare that to today. So there's a tremendous amount of interest and work in this topic. So that's the good news. The not so good news is that there's a lot of confusion about what we even mean by emotion regulation and what this research has really told us. And so what I'd like to do, as I mentioned at the outset of today's talk is five things. First, define our terms. Second, talk about the process model of emotion regulation. Third and fourth, talk about two forms of regulation. And then if time permits, we'll have some question and discussion. So let's get started with defining our terms. One of the things that's interesting about emotions and emotion regulation is that emotions are so much part of our everyday life. It's actually hard to see them clearly. We sometimes think of emotions as just feelings, but as you'll see, they're, they're, they're much more than this. From my perspective as an affective scientist, I think of emotions as biologically based responses to situations that are seen as personally relevant. Our emotions, although biologically based, are also shaped by learning, which means that each of us has quite different emotions, even in what seem to be the same situations. This is a short video segment taken from the TV show Survivor, in which people are watching uh, an, another contestant uh, have some difficulty. And notice the differences in how people respond during this short video segment. The man seems quite happy at the difficulties faced by the other contestant, whereas the women seem horrified. And this is just a reminder that the emotions that we have, each of us, even in quote, the same situation, really are quite different. Emotions usually involve changes, not just in subjective experience, although that's often important, but also expressive behavior and peripheral physiology. And it's this loosely coordinated set of changes that we are referring to when we talk about emotions. Now, emotions are just the starting point today because as we've discussed, emotions are sometimes helpful and sometimes not helpful. And our concern, particularly today, will be what happens when emotions are judged not to be helpful. That's when we start to think about emotion regulation. But here too, we have to be careful with our terms. So let's lay out one way of thinking about emotion regulation as an umbrella term for all of the processes that influence which emotions you have, when you have them, how you experience and express these emotions, and crucially, these processes that are influencing one or another aspect of emotions are defined by the activation of a goal to change the emotion. Now this can sometimes be conscious and sometimes unconscious, but there needs to be a goal that's activated so that you're on purpose trying to change one or more aspects of the emotion. That's crucial for what I mean by emotion regulation. This may involve regulating your own emotions or it can involve regulating someone else's emotions as teachers often have to do with their students or parents have to do with their children. Importantly, emotion regulation can be used to either increase or decrease 
either negative or positive emotions. Some of these types of regulation are very intuitive. And to give you a feel for these types of emotion regulation goals, I want to use a very simple two by two matrix. In the upper left, we have, I think, some of the most obvious forms of regulation. We might be trying to calm ourselves down when angry. That would be a self-focused form of regulation or helping a tearful child untangle a kite. That would be an other focused form of regulation. But in either case, in the upper left quadrant, we're trying to decrease some aspect of negative emotion. That's very intuitive. That's often what we're trying to do when we regulate our emotions. Another quadrant that I think is very intuitive is the lower right quadrant. Here, we're trying to increase one or more aspects of positive emotion. So we might share great news with close friends or tell someone a joke to try to cheer them up when they're down. What's I think important but less appreciated are these other two cells. For example, we may sometimes want to increase negative emotion. In an academic context, we might want to get psyched before a big game, pump oneself up, fire oneself up, or reframe a friend's little fight with a spouse is actually a very serious thing, depending on when, whether one's focusing on oneself or another person. So those would be examples of increasing negative emotion to achieve goals that are important, winning a game or helping a, a friend uh, better appreciate the seriousness of uh, relational difficulties. The last of these four cells is times when we try to decrease our positive emotion. And there are many examples of this, even though that may not be what we're first thinking of when we think of emotion regulation. We can wipe a smile off our face when it would be inappropriate, such as a serious meeting or a funeral, or you might help giggling children calm down at bedtime. So these would be examples of decreasing positive emotion. So I hope I've impressed you with the enormity of this domain, the many, many things that we might need to do to increase or decrease negative or positive emotion in ourselves and in others. So it's a huge space. And one of the big challenges of work in this area is to try to find a simple conceptual scheme for organizing what would otherwise be unmanageable lists of things, activities that we might engage in to regulate our emotions. And that brings us to what I've referred to as the process model of emotion regulation. And this process model starts with a very simple idea, namely that if we want to organize how we might regulate our emotions, the first thing to do is to think about how emotions are generated in the first place. So let's think about emotion generation in the simplest possible terms. Emotions are generated in situations when we attend to them and then think in particular ways about what we're seeing or noticing. And that pattern of thinking or appraisal is what gives rise to our multi-component response, the experience, the behavior, and the physiology. So for example, in the context, sadly, of the pandemic, we may think, this virus is, is dangerous. It's disrupted our ways of lives. That may be the situation. We pay attention. We may focus on getting more and more information from the media about COVID-19. We can then think based on what we're learning, things will not change and I'm trapped from every side. And that may lead us to feel anxious and sad. We may also experience anxiety symptoms of our heart racing, and we may snap at other people. And unfortunately, those responses can actually have the effect of modifying the situation that gave rise to the emotion in the first place. In this case, if we get anxious enough and sad enough, that may actually fray our relationships and confidence so that we feel more isolated. So there's a negative spiral that can uh, evolve as we generate emotions in this particular 
context. And what's important here is the idea that if that's how emotions are generated, then one way to organize how we regulate our emotions will be to think about the things we can do at each of these major steps in the emotion generative process. So let's take the emotion generative process, that very simple schematic that I gave you a moment ago, and think about how we can use that to distinguish different categories or families of emotion regulation processes. One thing we might do in this process model of emotion regulation is to try to change the situation that's giving rise to these emotions. Sometimes that's easier, sometimes that's harder. Another thing we can do, a second family of emotion regulation processes, comes at the attention stage where we can actually take steps to change what we're attending to. And in the case of the pandemic, for most of us, it's easier to change our attention than it is to change the physical situation around us. A third family of regulatory processes involves changing our thinking. So here we may be in a situation, paying attention in certain ways, but we can nonetheless change some aspects of our thinking and thereby change the subsequent emotions. That's a third family of regulatory processes. And finally, a fourth family of regulatory processes is that we're in a situation, we've attended to it, thought about it in a way that's making us emotional, but now we can still try to change one or more aspects of the emotion once it's actually been activated and it's unfolding. So these then are the major families of emotion regulation processes that are described by the process model of emotion regulation. And it just again is a simple scheme for understanding how we get from the way emotions generated to the ways it might be regulated to try to give us a conceptual framework for this space. And over the past two decades or so, researchers from around the world have used the process model to try to figure out what the impact is of different types of emotion regulation. Many of them have been motivated by the idea, which is part of the process model, that early strategies, ones that come very early in the assembly of an emotion, may be higher impact than ones that come at the very end. And to try to get at this idea, we and other people have focused on two forms of emotion regulation in particular. Suppression, which is a form of response modulation, which comes all the way at the end of the chain. And then rethinking, which comes one step earlier. That's a type of cognitive change also known as reappraisal. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to summarize several decades of research, hundreds and hundreds of studies focused first on suppression. Suppression in this context, again, is a form of response-focused emotion regulation, and it refers to inhibiting expressive emotion behavior. You're feeling emotional, you're in the situation, you're thinking about it in a way that's making you emotional, but you try not to show the behavior on your face. What have we learned happens when you suppress? Well, one thing that's obvious is that your behavior is decreased. That's what you're trying to do, and you certainly can do that in many circumstances. But importantly, your feelings, how you feel inside, those don't tend to change. You don't feel better, so you look cool, but you don't feel cool. And crucially, your physiological responses are actually magnified. And to show this, I'll, I'll share a data panel from one of our early studies in which participants were randomly assigned to watch upsetting film clips, either under the condition to just watch as they normally would, or to try to suppress, to hide their expressive behavior. During these studies, we carefully monitored by videotaping and using physiological measurement. And one of the key findings from these studies was that compared to people who were just watching, people who were suppressing during the film presentation, which you can see on the right side of this panel, the line marked suppress, show dramatic increases in a composite of cardiovascular responses. So their cardiovascular system was working much, much harder when they were suppressing. 
compared to people who were not suppressing. Intriguingly, we found that not only do I pay pr a price as I suppress my emotions, but if two people are interacting, the partner who's not even trying to regulate his or her emotions may also pay an increased uh, cost. And that's shown in one of the studies we did by increases in blood pressure, both in the person who's suppressing and in the person who's just interacting with the person who's suppressing. That's shown in this panel where we can see that in a conversation, there are increases in blood pressure as two people who don't know each other are interacting. The people who were randomly assigned, they were given cues over their headphones to suppress during the conversation, show elevated blood pressure, that's the middle panel. But crucially, it's not just the suppressors, it's their partners who were not told to regulate. They were just interacting with someone who was suppressing and you can see their blood pressure is highest of all. So I hope I've convinced you that at least under some circumstances in the laboratory, you can see these costs of suppression. But one of the things we really wanna know, of course, is not just what happens over seconds or minutes in the laboratory, but what happens in everyday life. And to study this, we have to move to a different approach, which is an individual difference approach where we create and have created measures asking people about whether they typically use suppression in everyday life. Using those measures, what do we find? People who say they suppress a lot in everyday life compared to those who don't report less positive emotion and more negative emotion. They have higher stress levels, more burnout, less close social relationships, and worse cardiovascular health. So this is a pretty discouraging pattern for what happens when you spend a lot of time suppressing your emotion expressive behavior. So one crucial question is whether this is, these costs are associated with all forms of regulation or whether some forms of regulation might have superior uh, outcomes associated with them. And to figure that out, we and others have contrasted suppression with a type of cognitive change called rethinking or reappraisal. And that comes a step earlier in the emotion generation process. And we had thought that this might be a higher leverage point of impact. You could make a change that would actually really bend the trajectory of the emotion. So again, what do we mean by rethinking? This is trying to change the meaning of a situation to decrease its impact. And I'd like to emphasize again that these ideas go back hundreds, if not thousands of years. So for example, Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic emperor in the late second century AD said, if you're distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to revoke at any moment. And this I think plays out in everyday life. Students uh, interacting might overhear someone saying something nasty. That may trigger thoughts. I'm a worthless person and associated emotions. But if we change the thought, for example, they're in no position to judge me. The idea is that we may be able to short circuit the emotion much more effectively than we do with suppression. So what do we find, we and others, in now two decades of research on this topic? What's the impact of rethinking? Well, first, behavior does decrease as it did with suppression, but the key difference here is that you actually feel better, you look cool and you feel better inside. Also, physiologically, you tend to have decreased physiological responses. And in a meta-analysis of almost 50 neuroimaging studies, Boole and colleagues found that there was decreased activity in, in emotion generative structures such as the amygdala, suggesting that these changes penetrate very deeply in our brain. Importantly, there do not seem to be important memory or social costs. So unlike suppression, which had big costs, 
rethinking does not seem to have those costs. Again, you may say, James, that's fine, but this is just over minutes to hours in the laboratory. Tell me about what happens when people use rethinking in everyday life. Are there benefits there? Because that becomes actually quite interesting. Here too, we've developed individual difference measures. And what do we find? Well, compared to people who do not use rethinking, people who use rethinking frequently experience more positive emotion and less negative emotion. They have less stress, closer relationships, and they have better physical health. So this is almost the mirror image of suppression. Whereas suppression had a lot of costs associated with it, rethinking does not appear to have uh, such high level of costs. Now, some people hearing about suppression and rethinking feel that maybe I'm just saying the same thing twice. Maybe if people who are constantly suppressing never rethink, or people who rethink never suppress. So these would be two sides of exactly the same coin. That would be a very reasonable confusion to have. But the key idea, the key thing that I need you to know is that suppression use and reappraisal or rethinking use are uncorrelated. What that means, and this is very important, is that someone can be high on one and either high or low on the other. They're uncorrelated meaning that these are two separate effects. So that if you wanna have the best possible outcomes, our research is telling you, use rethinking frequently to get all those benefits and use suppression infrequently and very selectively to avoid those costs. Unfortunately, there are people who don't know this information and they tend to use lots of suppression and very little rethinking. And there they get all the costs and none of the benefits. So the key point then that I'd like to emphasize at this point in our discussion is that emotions are sometimes helpful and sometimes not. When they're not helpful, we've found that the process model provides a nice framework for thinking about the ways that we can influence or regulate emotions as they are, uh, occur. And crucially, we found that Incrucialmente hemos encontrado que hay diferentes estrategias que realmente tienen diferentes consecuencias para la trayectoria emocional dentro de nosotros y también para otros, donde la supresión en general tiene altos costos. Y eh. Let me say a few more things uh, and then let's turn. I'd like to save as much time as we can for uh, discussion. Um, questions and discussion, but let me just say a few more things and then we can open things up to ensure that we have enough time. Uh, one idea that we've uh, begun to really focus on is that people differ in which emotion regulation strategies they use. And I suspect this will be a major theme of the uh, conference that you're attending. And one of the reasons I think that people differ in their use of strategies, some preferring much more adaptive strategies, others using a mix, and others still using primarily maladaptive strategies. One of the reasons for this, I think, is the beliefs that these individuals have. Some people believe that emotions just can't be changed. They think, for example, that emotions are sort of like weather. You just can't do anything about it. Others, however, believe that emotions can be changed and that one can get better at emotion regulation by practicing. Here the idea is, is not that you have perfect control over your emotions, of course, that's not possible, but that you have partial control, just as we might shape a lump of clay. There's the clay that's given, that's our temperament, but we can shape that through experience into different types of um, outcomes. And Crucially, people who believe that emotions can be changed are much, much more likely to use rethinking and other helpful and adaptive forms of emotion regulation than people who do not have this belief. So this then I think is the crucial take home message that emotions can in fact be changed and that different approaches to regulating our emotions have really very, very different consequences.
to help ourselves and to help the people we love and our clients and students and everyone around us to engage in more healthy emotional lives, we need to better understand these regulatory strategies, understanding which are helpful and which aren't helpful. What are the circumstances in which they're helpful? What are the circumstances in which they're harmful? And then to help educate people so that their beliefs allow them to see that emotions can in fact often be changed and that different strategies have very different consequences. And so all of us need to learn more about emotion and emotion regulation and come to develop a more sophisticated set of tools for flexibly adjusting our emotions. With that, I'd like to stop and I can uh, stop my screen share. And then I would love to um, open up uh, the, the floor for questions, which I think will be interpreted. I hope so, because I'll be much more useful if I can end up with something in English. So uh, I'll let one of the moderators or, or panelists, yep. Dr. Nunes, is this OK to uh, uh, turn I things to questions? It. Yeah, we have uh, 13 questions. Um, I'll talk in Spanish in order to the translator uh, talk to you, OK? Yeah, so, la primera pregunta dice, ¿cómo puedo reevaluar las emociones y si existen ejercicios para desarrollarlo? Wonderful question. Thank you so much. So, um, the, the, the question again is, uh, you know, is there, how can I learn how to do more rethinking? Um, and uh, the, the, I think there are several steps. The first step in my mind is actually to, to, to notice the emotions that we're having. I think many of us move through our everyday lives. We're so busy, we're thinking about all of these different things and we don't even pay attention to which emotions we're experiencing. And I think before we can change our emotions, we need to know what emotions we're experiencing or likely to experience in a particular context. So the first step then is noticing. Once we've noticed emotions, the next step in my mind is reflecting on those emotions. Even though I'm someone whose whole career has focused on emotion regulation, the first thing I always say in my talks is that sometimes emotions are terrific. We don't wanna regulate them. We wanna just have our emotions and enjoy them. But at other times we wanna reflect and decide that we do wanna regulate. So the first steps in my mind are noticing our emotions and then reflecting on them. And only when we've decided on balance, we think we really need to adjust our emotions, do we proceed to the next step? In terms of how to rethink more successfully once we decide that that's really appropriate, I think the key is to uh, understand and believe that emotions can actually be modified. And one of the practices that I encourage with students and people I work with is to take a situation that they found to be upsetting and then to help them articulate how it is they were interpreting or seeing the situation. Let's take a simple example. Somebody walks by on the far side of the street, you wave to them and they ignore you. Many of us, even during the pandemic, have this a muchos de nosotros nos ha pasado esto. interpretation, which some of us might have immediately is, wow, they must really be angry with me. They completely didn't pay attention to my greeting. But another interpretation is that with our masks on or looking the other way, the person may not have even seen us. Maybe he or she was distracted. And I think taking a specific situation in which you've felt yourself to be upset, articulating your thinking, and then practicing with some help, what are the other ways you could be thinking about it? And then set yourself a challenge of trying to notice more and more situations and then articulating the ways that you're thinking about the things that have made you upset, and then try to challenge yourself to find other ways of thinking. What are the other things that could have been happening? Because so often, particularly in interpersonal interactions, we leap to one conclusion, when in fact, there are other very reasonable ways of thinking about the situation. So that would be my recommendation for steps, noticing emotions, reflecting on them, and then practicing by articulating the way you've been thinking, and then trying to find alternatives. En realidad tenemos muchas preguntas. Yo creo que por el tiempo no vamos a poder eh, planteárselas todas. Eh. 
Yeah. Um, ok. Aquí hay una pregunta de, de Jaime Silva, doctor Silva. Dice, we, we could imagine that each emotional regulation strategy can vary on a continuum from low to excessive levels. Is there any research that analyze, analyzes the effects of excessive rethinking? So my understanding of the question is that, um, uh, or comment, is that emotion regulation strategies differ in terms of their effectiveness. And the question is, have there been studies that compare more forms of regulation one to the next? Dr. Nunez, have I got that correct? Dr. Silva, podría clarificar si eso es lo que está efectivamente? Of course. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Gross. <laughs> uh, my question is, is there any research that, uh, sorry, I have the translation. Let me stop this. Uh, okay. Uh, is there any research that analyzed the effect of excessive rethinking? Oh, I see. So can you do too much rethinking? Have I understood that correctly? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. So, the question. Yes. Uh, you know, we we you. in in our in our individual difference work, where we look at how people uh, use emotion regulation of different types. The more rethinking people do, in general, the better. There's not an upper limit. So when you're plotting good outcomes on the y-axis and frequency of use of regulation, it's a positive slope all the way up. But I will say this, I do think that that may miss important instances of rethinking that are actually unhelpful. And let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, way that we can rethink may actually miss important details of a situation so that we start to have less and less reality-based forms of thinking so that we start to think ourselves into a cloud where it doesn't really relate to the real world. Because sometimes when we're interacting with someone in work or in a home situation, we may be in a very negative relationship. But if we use our rethinking to justify the other person and make excuses and say they didn't mean it, this could make us feel better in the moment. But it could have huge costs because by continually using rethinking, we may stay in the same negative work or family situation and not make much needed changes. So I think your intuition is exactly right. We have not found that generally there's too much rethinking, but I do think that there's growing evidence that in some contexts using rethinking actually can be negative. And one research study to give you an example done by one of my students, Iris Mouse, who's now a professor at University of California, Berkeley, found that if people use a lot of rethinking in situations that really can't be changed, like the pandemic, that's very helpful. But if they use rethinking in situations that can be changed, that's actually unhelpful because you should actually use your emotions to change the situation rather than just changing your emotions. Thank you very much for that question. It was a great question. Thank you, Dr. Gross. My okay. pleasure. Yeah. Okay, Vicente Mariscal says, I heard uh, Angela Duckworth uh, saying that it's more useful to regulate emotions in earlier stages of the process model of emotion regulation. Is that true? Uh, today, we saw the difference in the impact of uh, regulating mo our emotions at the response and thinking, thinking, uh, thinking stage. What is the impact of if we regulate uh, our emotions by modifying our attention or situation? Wonderful question. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. So uh, Angela Duckworth is a friend and colleague, uh, and she and I both believe, in fact, that the earlier we go in the emotion generative process, in general, the better it is. So even though I contrasted the last two steps, rethinking versus suppression, 
I think the questioner is right to think that if we go earlier and earlier and actually change the situation itself, that may be even more effective forms of form of regulation. And what Angela has done in her work uh, is to show that this is this idea is in fact true, that if we can change a situation so that we or others don't even have the emotion in the first place, that's going to be much more effective even than trying to be in a situation that's could give rise to emotion that we have to rethink. And Angela has extended this work in her process model of self-control to show that, in fact, these ideas about trying to understand how impulses are generated and how they can be regulated applies even beyond emotions to other impulses. Let's say that we're really hungry and that we want to eat something. And we feel like eating something really tempting, like a piece of cake but we're on a diet and we don't really want to eat that. How can we manage that impulse? What Angela has found is that if you wait all the way until the end and just try to suppress, that's not going to work very well. But if you can create a situation where you shift your attention to a healthier food, or if you just avoid the situation by not having cake in your house at all, that's going to be much, much more effective than these later strategies. And I think the crucial idea here is you want to start as early as you can, and you want to have lots of different strategies you can use. Thank you for that great question. Okay, next question. <laughs> as I told you, we have a lot of questions. But... Great. <laughs> uh, Emilia uh, Vilata says, I would like to know what is your opinion about the idea of accept acceptance of emotion or uh, emotions or negative thoughts, for instance of some contextual, con, contextual therapies like ACT, the promotion of acceptances. Is a therapeutic strategy compatible with the idea of uh, emotional regulation? Yes, oh, wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking. So one of the things I didn't mention just because of time is acceptance. And as the comment uh, suggests, acceptance is a very important intervention strategy in many clinical traditions including um, uh, some of the contemporary third wave uh, cognitive behavioral therapies. And from my perspective, I see uh, acceptance as a complex emotion regulation strategy. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, what I've tried to do with the process model, it's a little bit like on the piano playing one note at a time, but you can change the situation, you can change your attention, you can change your thinking and you can change your behavior. But when we get more advanced on the piano, we, we don't play one note at a time, we can play chords of several notes at a time. And I think of acceptance as a more complex emotion regulation strategy, just like a chord might be compared to playing single notes. And let me explain what I mean by that. In acceptance uh, therapies, like mindfulness-based stress reduction or some of the other uh, types of acceptance vehicles. What we're doing is we're often hitting all of the different strategies. For example, we may create situations that are calm and peaceful, allowing us to reflect on our experiences. So that's changing the situation. We're not rushing around in the world. We're trying to create a calm situation. What do we do in that calm situation? We pay attention focusing inwards on our thoughts and feelings. That's a very big change in our attention. How do we think about what's happening inside us? Well, we're again, we're cha making changes. How are we changing? Instead of thinking of our emotions as fixed and permanent, and instead we see them like leaves floating down a stream, changeable as clouds are in the sky, confident that they will arise and dissipate. It's a very different way of thinking. And then what about response change, response modulation? Instead of doing what most adults in our culture do, which is to clamp down on our emotions and try to really make sure they don't get too uh, extreme, this is a moment where we can relax some of those suppression tendencies. So from my perspective, acceptance is a complex emotion regulation strategy built from the building blocks of the process model and involving, in my view, every single one of these steps. And I think it, for that reason can be very, very powerful form of emotion regulation. 
Okay. Uh, Tomás Pro, Pro uh, asks whether the, the, if the, there is a relationship between uh, the, the language development and the, the um, uh, efficacy of the emotional regulation process. Ah, this is a great question. Wow. Um, I don't think we have a perfect answer yet, um, but let me say a couple of things. Number one, uh, I think that developmentally, children become more and more sophisticated at emotion regulation as they become more sophisticated in their language use and production. So that as we try to make sense of the world around us and inside us, one of the most powerful tools we have is language. And as is often the case, when we're trying to change a system, we really need to be able to label it and make differentiated sort of representations of the situation. If it's all a big mess and a big blur, we're not gonna know where to put our hands to try to change things. So I think developmentally, there's good evidence to say that some of the more sophisticated forms of regulation like rethinking really do require some uh, fairly substantial language skills. Other forms of regulation, I should say, like attention deployment, we think do not require those skills. And in fact, may be evident very, very early in life. So the different strategies have different requirements for language, but rethinking certainly requires, I think, quite a bit of language. So that's the first observation. Second observation is that there's actually some uh, controversy in the literature about what the impact of labeling our emotions is. Some research suggests that labeling our emotions itself is a form of regulation. It distances ourselves from the emotion. We, we objectify it. We say, that's not me, that's my emotion. And by using language, we then distance ourselves, decreasing the emotion. So that's one uh, idea. But another idea is that somehow by labeling the emotion, and if we then go to try to use rethinking, we may be less successful at rethinking because we've turned it into a thing rather than something that's more flexible and protean. So I think there's some controversy about the specific role of language uh, and whether that helps regulation or harms regulation. And from my perspective, I think that's a story that still has to be told. But the big picture idea is that developmentally, many forms of regulation require language. And certainly, as we interact with other people, we want to move beyond regulating our own emotions to others' emotions. That's often going to be mediated, but not always often mediated via language. So we can sometimes calm someone down by touching their arm and soothing them, but most frequently, we're gonna be using language to try to communicate our ideas and try to help other people with their regulation efforts. Okay, um, the last two questions, I think they are mostly uh, related to each other. So the first one is, uh, how uh, would, you, would you suggest to encourage in kids their rethinking as they sometimes just react uh, without having an insight of uh, Inside, I think, of their emotions. And the second one is how uh, rethinking can uh, start when a person has a behavioral pattern without emotional regulation despite the negative impacts. Yeah, I think in both cases, what's uh, important here is seeing that there's an alternative. I'll, I'll tell you one thing that we did, uh, my wife and I, when we were raising our children. Our children are now a little bit older. They're in, they're in college and two of them have finished college. But when they were little, and they used to get in fights, we would often take them uh, hand in hand. And we would then say, uh, uh, you know, you're, you two of you have gotten upset and we, we wanna understand each of your perspectives. And see, so we would ask one of the children, what's your perspective? And then the child would be allowed to say what her perspective was. And then would turn holding hands to the other person and say, and what's your perspective? So from very, very early on, when they were only a few years old, just starting to use language, they had the idea that of course emotions arise, and of course it's because people have different perspectives. And I think this very simple idea that emotions arise because of the situations we're in, how we pay attention and what we think, that's something that 
children can understand. And if it's baked into their routines, I think they can start to uh, learn to regulate their own emotions and others' emotions. But I think this is a very, very fundamental question. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be the future. If we can help younger people better understand emotions and how to regulate, I think many of the problems and much of the distress we see in society today will be substantially diminished. That's my hope. Okay, thanks. Okay, we, we are on, on time. Um, Dr. Gross, thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation and for sharing your, your knowledge and experience uh, with us. With us, it's my great pleasure. It was a it was a huge honor, and I I wish you and your uh, conference goers a very productive conference. Thank you so much for inviting me. So, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Okay, thank Bye. you. Be well. Bye.